Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I was in my driveway recording one of my weekly videos for the church when I heard my youngest son screaming. Levi had insisted on coming outside with me, and he was playing on the porch, arranging little wooden fruits and vegetables into a facsimile of a produce stand. But suddenly he was crying and screaming, barely coherent, shouting that something had stung him twice, once in the arm and again in the leg. And he tried to hobble towards me pitifully, clutching both of these wounds. I brought him inside. I put some ice on what I figured were bee stings. And with a couple of band-aids and a big hug from dad, he managed to calm down just fine. I figured that was the end of it until my wife, Angela, came bursting through the front door the next day, clutching her arm and a little short of breath, reporting that something had stung her while she was out on the porch. A bit of investigation revealed the source of the horror, a wasp nest that had been built just under the wooden railing of the porch, right where Levi had been pretending to sell his vegetables. It was clear that something had to be done, so we held a family meeting to toss out a few ideas. How about poison, I suggested. Wasp spray? Angela shook her head. There's a cluster of monarch butterflies right next to the porch, she replied. So I'd rather not spray poison around. Oh, I know, Levi offered. Let's drive Dad's car into the nest and smash it. We assured him as politely as possible that we would not be driving my car into the front porch, even though that would be pretty cool. And he squinted his eyes for a moment furrowed his brow, lost in thought. And then he replied, What about bears? Bears? Yeah, we could buy a bear and tell it to attack the wasps. I thought about that for a minute. It just might be crazy enough to work. But once you get rid of the wasps, how do you get rid of the bear? Just get the hose, Angela sighed. And so it was that I found myself in my front yard on a hot summer afternoon, armored in a thick leather jacket, two pairs of jeans, gloves, a scarf, protective eyewear, and a cowboy hat, shooting a jet of water at the porch from 20 feet away. My neighbor, who already seems to think I am a little strange, was just coming home from work when he saw me, shaking his head and retreating into his house. The hose did the trick, mostly. Wasps angrily swarmed out of the nest, fleeing from the tsunami as it tore the hive apart. Eventually it began to crumble and fell from the railing onto the deck, at which point I dared a closer look. I could see the soggy chambers of the nest, hexagonal cells slumped in on themselves, abandoned in the mad rush to escape. Looking down at the remains of that nest, it occurred to me that our spaces aren't structured so differently. A series of fractal patterns, cells, rooms that comprise our office buildings, our schools, our neighborhoods, and our homes, and a lot of those spaces have been lost too. I watched a movie last week that drove this point home with a hammer. It's called Vivarium, the title itself referring to a kind of curated living space designed for study, like an aquarium or a terrarium. It's a disturbing film about a young couple shopping for their first home, a scary enough prospect by itself. They find themselves visiting a new housing development that is filled with identical, sickly green residences. And after attempting to leave, they discover that they cannot find 
the way out. After a few hours, their car runs out of gas, leaving them stranded at a house that they are now forced to call home. The movie is peppered with aerial shots of the neighborhood, the houses in neat, unbroken rows, a not-so-subtle metaphor for a kind of hive or insect nest. I think it's supposed to be a movie about the quiet horrors of suburbia and domesticity, but in the midst of the pandemic, it acquires new meaning. Stuck in this house with each other, with nothing to do and nowhere to go, their world has contracted to a single space. Attempts to escape it are frustrated. However far they try to walk, they always arrive back at the same house. And things become even more claustrophobic when a mysterious baby arrives on their doorstep one day with a cryptic note that reads, Raise the child and be released. The baby grows abnormally fast, becoming a small boy in a matter of weeks, and he is a terror. He speaks with a strange, post-pubescent voice, mimics his parents like a parrot, and shrieks like a banshee while they prepare his breakfast cereal, not stopping until the last drop of milk is poured to his satisfaction. I've got to say, living in relative quarantine with a demanding five-year-old, this scenario strikes a little too close to home. And as the child grows into a man, the young couple grows increasingly afraid of him, retreating to their bedroom and even taking their meals there behind the locked door. Their world continues to shrink, confined first to this neighborhood, and then the house, and finally, the bedroom, the only safe place left. For most of us, our world has grown smaller these past few months, claustrophobic even. For working folks, the morning commute is only about 10 feet between one room and another. We might even work in the same room that we sleep. For parents of young children, those kids have been largely confined to the house, at least more than usual. And the church, for most of you, has shrunk to the size of a computer screen. I keep thinking about that wasp nest, its little chambers being flooded by the garden hose, rendered uninhabitable one space at a time. I think about us, all of us, forced to retreat from the spaces we once occupied, the aforementioned office buildings and schools, the neighborhoods and homes of family and friends, as if a great flood had carried them all away. I think about myself spending most of my days working in a small room. I think about our church, too, limited in so many ways to a single space, a single camera frame. But most of all, I think about the wasps that managed to escape, flying off into a bigger world, determined to build a new home. And I hope they made it, despite my own crimes against them. I hope they made it. In the sixth century of the Common Era, more or less, some Celtic monks established the monastery of Clonmacnoy in Ireland. It became a magnificent center of learning and prayer for over 300 years, until the first Viking ship arrived at its shores, carrying men determined to pillage its treasures. That was the beginning of the end, though the end wouldn't come for some time. But successive years watched the monastery decline, the monks who dwelled there surrendering, surrendering bits and pieces of it to destruction and decay until there was nothing left. Reading an account of this history the other day, I was struck by something the author wrote. I think about what it must have been like during those centuries of decline, he muses. 
what it was like at the very end, as the last monks of Clon Magnoy lived out their days among the decaying ruins. In particular, I wonder about the last monk of Clon Magnoy, the man who said the last mass there and blew out the last candle. What would it be like to meet him and speak with him? What if I were to tell him that after many centuries had come and gone, the Pope of Rome would come down from the sky in a red box and walk among those ruins and speak to a crowd of 20,000 people? He would find it, no doubt, very hard to believe. And yet, it happened. When you're wandering in the wilderness, it's hard to believe in the promised land. And it's all too easy to believe that God has abandoned us there. Just as those ancient Israelites who wandered for 40 years in the desert often believed that God had left them to die of hunger and thirst. But God was there. In the pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night. God was at Clonmacnoy with that last monk as he celebrated Mass. And God is with us, looking ahead to a future that we cannot see. Like Moses, we may not even live to see it, but it's there. You've probably all heard the famous footprints in the sand story, you know, the one where a guy's on the beach with Jesus and they're looking at these two sets of footprints where they've walked together over the years. And the man points out that when things were hardest for him, there was only one set of footprints and he accuses Jesus of abandoning him when he needed him most. To which Jesus famously replies, no, no. Where you see only one set of footprints, that is where I carry it's corny, but I have to confess, it always chokes me up. I saw a comic strip last week that had a little fun with this narrative. In the comic, a little cartoon Jesus points at the footprints and says, that is where I carried you. And then he points at a groove in the sand and he says, that's where I dragged you for a while. And then he points elsewhere and he says, one time I hid you in that little sand hole while I went to get a hot dog. feels a bit like that these days, doesn't it? Like God is out to lunch. I think the disciples felt that way too when Jesus said that he was going to leave them for a while. But where are you going? They plead with him desperately. Their world has gotten smaller too, reduced to the span of a rented room that will be their home for the next several weeks. But Jesus assures them that he is only going prepare a place for them, a bigger world, a more expansive horizon, a house with many rooms, and a land of many dwelling places. And sure enough, after Pentecost, their world gets a whole lot bigger. As a pastor, I have sat with many people in their final days in home hospice care. My own father was one of them. And one thing that always strikes me is how small their world has become, often reduced to a single room of the house, even a single bed. The rest of the world is out of reach. But like the last monk of Clonmacnoy, like the last wasp evacuating from the wreckage of its nest, they too are destined for a new home. Friends, the world that we knew, or thought we knew, may be lost to us. Whatever happens, I don't think things will ever look quite the same again. And as we look back on a summer of death and decline, we must also look forward to an autumn of new possibilities. That will require us to change our paradigm, to get really creative, and to learn how to live all over again.
to marshal all of our resources and all of our faith to build a new home. In just a couple of weeks, we will be celebrating Rally Day at our church. It won't be like any Rally Day that's gone before, but we will be in our newly refinished sanctuary, virtually, though it awaits our eventual return. We'll be offering ways to connect, and we will be celebrating a jubilee, the rarest of ancient Jewish festivals that occurs only once every 50 years, in which debts are forgiven, slaves are freed, property is redistributed, and society as a whole just kind of starts over. And maybe, given the state of things, that's exactly what we need. This is not the beginning of the end. This is the end of the beginning. The first painful chapter, a long six months, is behind us. The nest is gone. But a new home awaits if we have the courage to take flight and start again. Amen.